Praised be Jesus and Mary. Brothers and sisters, complete my joy by being of the same mind, with the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. It's the will of God, it's the will of Christ for his disciples to be united, to be one, to be united especially in, in the church that our Lord founded. And today and tomorrow, these two days, Pope Francis is in is visiting Sweden to commemorate something that broke, that undermined the unity of Christ's disciples. He's there to commemorate the revolt of Martin Luther, which by means of a euphemism is often called the Protestant Reformation. And we can hardly, I think, we can hardly expect an objective commentary or or a collect, correct theological interpretation of the significance of this event unless we go out of our way and, and try to find a commentary and a correct theological interpretation. So we'll do that today. And it's not all that, it's not all that difficult. We'll look at for ourselves at what the status of, Rome, of uh, Martin Luther is in the church by looking at a document published during his lifetime by Pope Leo X, which took notice of his errors and, and condemned them, and which is still very pertinent today, and will help us to avoid getting confused. So on June 15th, 1520, Pope Leo X wrote about Martin Luther, who was then becoming very prominent and was spreading his errors. He wrote, Arise, O Lord, and judge your own cause. Remember your reproaches to those who are filled with foolishness all through the day. When you were about to, descend to ascend to your father, you committed the care and rule and administration of the vineyard, an image of the triumphant church, to Peter as the head and vicar of your church and to his successors. Rise then, Peter, and fulfill this pastoral office divinely entrusted to you as mentioned above. Give heed to the cause of the Holy Roman Church, mother of all churches and teacher of the faith, whom you by the order of God have consecrated by your blood. Against the Roman Church, you warned lying teachers are rising, introducing ruinous sects and drawing upon themselves speedy doom. Their tongues are fire, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. They have bitter zeal, contention in their hearts, and boast and lie against the truth. These errors have, at the suggestion of the human race, been revived and recently propagated among the more frivolous and illustrious German nation. He's, of course, referring to the Protestant so-called reformers in Germany of that time, and specifically Martin Luther. And then the Pope, Leo X, goes on to list 41 grievous errors which Martin Luther taught, which illustrate really a the abyssal distance between the teaching of, of Christ, and the teaching of his apostles, the teaching of the fathers of the church and of the church, and that of, of Luther. These were serious, grievous errors. That's why they, they really demanded a, a serious rebuttal and a condemnation. So the Pope goes on and lists them. Teachings of Martin Luther. And he goes on and say, to say, no one of sound mind is ignorant how destructive, pernicious, scandalous, and seductive to pious and simple minds these various errors are, how opposed they are to all charity and reverence for the Holy Roman Church, who is the mother of all the faithful and teacher of the faith, how destructive they are of the vigor of ecclesiastical discipline, namely obedience. This virtue is the font and origin of all virtues, and without it anyone is readily convicted of being unfaithful. With the advice, then, and consent of our venerable brethren, the cardinals, with mature deliberation on each and every one of these above theses, the 41 heirs, and the 95 theses of Martin Luther, and by the authority of Almighty God, the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own authority, we condemn, reprobate, and reject completely each of these theses or errors as either heretical, scandalous, false, offensive to pious ears, or seductive of simple minds and against Catholic truth. By listing them, we decree and declare that all the faithful must regard them as condemned, reprobated, and rejected. We restrain all in the virtue of holy obedience and under the penalty of an automatic major excommunication. 
Moreover, because the preceding errors and many others are contained in the books and writings of Martin Luther, we likewise condemn, reprobate, and reject completely the books and all the writings and sermons of, of the said Martin Luther, whether in Latin or any other language, which contain the said errors, or any one of them. And we wish them to be regarded as utterly condemned, reprobated, and rejected. We forbid each and every one of the faithful in virtue of holy obedience and under the above penalties to be incurred automatically. We forbid them to assert, to preach, to praise, to print, to publish, or to defend them. As far as Martin himself is concerned, O oh good God, what have we overlooked or not done? What fatherly charity have we omitted that we might call him back from such errors? We urged him through various conferences with our legate and through our personal letters to abandon these errors. We have even offered him safe conduct and the money necessary for the journey, urging him to come without fear or any misgivings, which perfect charity should cast out, and to talk not secretly but openly and face to face after the example of our Savior and the Apostle Paul. If he had done this, we are certain he would have changed his heart and he would have recognized his errors. But he always refused to listen, despising the previous citation in each and every one of the above overtures, disdaining to come. And to the present day, he has been contumacious. And I would here just suggest that it would be good to go out of our way even more and to read a little bit of the life of Martin Luther and to try to understand just how vulgar was his response to the Holy Father to each and every one of the invitations to an honest dialogue, we would say today. Just how vulgar, and vulgar is the right word, because he employed four-letter words, four-letter words in his vulgar response to any signs of goodwill on the part of the Holy Father. Therefore, we can, without any further citation or delay, proceed against him to his condemnation and damnation as one, with, as one whose faith is notoriously suspect and, in fact, a true heretic, with the full severity of each and of all of the above penalties and censures. Yet with the advice of our brothers imitating the mercy of Almighty God, who does not wish the death of a sinner, but rather that he be converted and live, and forgetting all the injuries inflicted on us and on the apostolic see, we have decided to use all the compassion we are capable of. It is our hope, so far as, in, as it lies within us, that he will experience a change of heart by taking the road of mildness we have proposed, that he will return and turn away from his errors. We will receive him kindly as the prodigal son returning to the embrace of the church. Now, Martin Luther did not do this, but the Pope goes on. Therefore, let Martin Luther himself and all those adhering to him and those who shelter and support him through the merciful heart of our God and the sprinkling of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which and through whom the redemption of the human race and upbuilding of Holy Mother Church was accomplished, let all of them know that from our heart we exhort and beseech that he cease to disturb the peace, unity, and truth of the Church, for which the Savior himself died and earnestly prayed to the Father. Let him abstain from his pernicious errors that he may come back to us. And if they, the Lutherans, if they really will obey and certify to us that they have obeyed, they will find in us the affection of a Father's love, the opening of the font of the effects of paternal charity, and an opening of the font of mercy and clemency. So today, 499 years later, after Martin Luther's revolt, we are still waiting for the supporters to show those desired signs of repentance, of obedience, of a return to Christ's church and to his gospel. And hopefully this papal visit of Pope Francis will, will help them to finally take those first but very necessary steps to achieve that reconciliation so that finally all might be one in Christ. Praised be Jesus in Mary.